So to answer the question of how secret keys are initially arranged among communicating parties, it's useful to consider two dimensions for a communication channel. So first we have an insecure channel. This is missing the property of security and the property of authenticity. So in an insecure channel, this is the, the standard. This is the default. This is like speaking over the telephone or speaking in a, in a room with other people. Anyone can listen. And when you're over the telephone, for example, you have no ability to see the other person. So you are also not even sure if you're really talking to them. I mean, you might use their voice as a clue that you are talking to them. But it could be a recording of their voice, you know, an example of a replay attack. Then, if we somehow manage to use encryption, because both parties, Alice and Bob, have an encryption key, we're able to turn that into a secure channel. This is where you encrypt the data being sent over it, you decrypt it on the other side, no one, sees, no one looking at the channel is able to see what's actually being sent. Despite that, it still may be the case that someone who knows the key is able to monitor the channel and then decrypt this data. But as long as only Alice and Bob are the only entities on the planet that have this key, then you are safe knowing that no one monitoring the communication channel can decrypt it so long as you use cryptography correctly and so forth. Next, we have an authentic channel. An authentic channel is one where the data was not tampered with, and you know the source of it. In this case, Alice knows she's talking to Bob, Bob knows he's talking to Alice, and the data that's being sent is not being, for instance, tampered with, changed by Eve along the way. For example, even though Alice and Bob are encrypting their traffic, it could be the case that Eve retransmits some encrypted traffic. Eve doesn't know what is being said, but Alice thinks she got the, the same message two times. And maybe that has some effect. Maybe Alice knows a message that indicates an alarm or a warning and then broadcasts that at a particular time or sends it to Alice at a particular time. Alice reads it, decrypts it, sees, oh, there's a warning, and thinks it's relevant now, but actually it was never sent at this point in time. Similarly, if... Eve removed traffic, simply deleted information from the channel, Alice may be unaware that some messages were sent because from Alice's perspective, they never arrived. So they, they were as good as not having been sent. So an authentic channel is one that doesn't have these properties. And similarly, Eve could even alter the message, flip bits, for example, in the message. Maybe it's not going to result in something useful. Maybe the, when you decrypt it, you'll just get some garbage. But maybe with some extraordinary luck, it, Eve is able to turn one message into another message. An authentic channel strives to get rid of all of these problems. Alice and Bob know they're talking to each other, not anyone else in pretending to be Alice and Bob, and they know that every message they receive is the one that was legitimately sent by that other party. And combining these two dimensions, one with confidentiality and one with integrity or authenticity, we end up with a secure, authentic channel, which is what we want to have. One where the data is secure, it's kept confidential, and its integrity is preserved. It's authentic. So in practice, these block ciphers, like AES, they're useful to provide security for the channel. It encrypts all the data on the channel. But something else is needed for authenticity, because... Eve can still replay the same AES encrypted message twice, and Alice won't know any better unless we do something else on top of that. So for the start, to have a shared key with, for example, the, the Google example, when I go and check my email, having a shared key between only me and the other entity that I'm communicating with, that's a good start, right? It allows us to achieve security, and we'll see it also allows us to achieve authenticity as well. But even still, we need to do something else in order to bootstrap the whole process, to somehow exchange the key between us. How do we get this initial key? So this is where public key cryptography has become, has stepped in to provide these needs. So in public key cryptography systems, there are two keys that are, in, that are related to each other. There's a public key 
and a private key. And the public key and the private key exist in relation to each other, meaning that for some particular public key, there is a corresponding private key. And what's nice about the public key is it is public in the sense that you can publish it, you can broadcast it widely, you can make sure that everyone sees it, it doesn't matter. There is an assumption, a, a computational assumption, albeit, but still an assumption nevertheless, that given a particular public key, it is in computationally impossible to determine the corresponding private key. And if you are familiar with the idea that factoring large numbers that plays an enormous role in computer security, this is why. Because one of the founding uh, public key crypto systems is, ba is called RSA, and it's based on the multiplication of large primes and the inability to factor them. And with these, you're able to encrypt messages with the public key, and then in turn decrypt it with the private key. So now the encryption operation, given a message M, you take the public key and you encrypt it to produce some ciphertext. The ciphertext can then be decrypted using the corresponding private key, and only with the private key, the public key is no longer useful, to return the original message M. Now this course will not cover the mathematics of public key cryptography, there's another course for that. So the important thing here is to just know that these concepts exist. That there is such a thing that allows us to, at least until the development of quantum computers, allows us to take a message, encrypt it with a public key, decrypt it with a private key. And the consequence of that is that if Alice is the only entity that knows K, Alice is the only entity that can compute the decryption of K. So if Bob knows Alice's public key, the PK that corresponds to K, Bob can encrypt Alice a message. Bob can encrypt a message. Only Alice can open it and, and see what that message is. And this is true for anyone. Anyone on the planet who is aware of Alice's public key can encrypt a message broadcast it widely, spread it all over the internet, but only Alice will be the one able to decrypt that message. The encryption and the decryption function are related, as are the, the public and private keys. And the assumption is that an entity who knows the encryption function and the decryption function, so knows how the system works, we call Kirchhoff's principle, and the public keys, and lots and lots and lots of ciphertext and plain text pairs, someone who knows all this will still not be able to determine the corresponding private key. So now we are able to do some notion of key negotiation because now Bob can, for instance, pick a key, encrypt it for Alice and send it to her, and then they can just use that key as a, as a simple example. There's also a corresponding notion of public key cryptography, which is used for signatures public key signatures. This is how you can sign a message so that someone else can verify that it was indeed signed by you. And in a sense, it works as though these two public key, this encrypt and decrypt operations were swapped. Imagine instead of computing to, instead of computing an encryption of a message with the public key and decrypting it with a private key, you instead encrypt the message using the private key, which produces some random-looking string that doesn't mean anything per se, except that anyone can decrypt it with a public key to obtain the original message again. So I can take in message M and a corresponding ciphertext C and claim that I'm the one who signed the message M, that I stand by message M, because only I, as the holder of the private key K, would be able to compute the ciphertext C. And anyone can take this C and run the decryption, the public key decryption operation, which produces the original message M, and verify that, yes, if I take Alice's public key and this message that Alice says she signed, and the purported signature, I can verify that the decryption with Alice's public key matches the message itself. And the idea being that Alice is the only entity capable of producing the C, which would mean that Alice, in a sense, stands by this message. Alice meant to say this message. Alice intended to say this message. Because 
anyone can make a claim that Alice said a particular message, but if there is a signature that Alice made on top of that message that only Alice can create, by virtue of choosing to compute that signature, is in effect standing by that message. So, a public key signature, it works by creating a number, in effect, a number that everyone can verify corresponds to a number, or a message, rather. That everyone can take this number, this bit string that they see, verify that it corresponds to a particular message. And everyone knows that only I can compute this number, which means that only I can authorize its computation. Only I can decide to compute this number. And by virtue of computing it, I am, in effect, signing that original message. An important thing about public key signatures, it's using the language signature, which means something in the, in the human world, the signature that you would use a pen that is used for all manner of legal contracts. And it is somewhat like a real world signature in the sense that only I can do the particular squiggly shapes that correspond to my unique signature and no one else could replicate that or at least so goes the assumption that underlies most of security in the physical world. But for public key cryptography, it is the case that, one, private keys can be stolen or copied, somehow compromised. You might not be aware. So your private key is not some knowledge that you have in your head, but rather it's a file on your computer. So if someone gains access to this particular file on your computer, they then gain access to this corresponding private key, which may not be a good thing. It means that they would be able to also compute this number. Recall that the underlying assumption of public key signatures is that only Alice is the one capable of producing the number that can be uh, verified by checking it against Alice's public key. But if an attacker, Eve, manages to steal Alice's private key, then Eve can impersonate Alice. Eve can produce all manners of signatures that claim, that appear, that superficially appear to have come from Alice, though they were not actually things that Alice had intended to sign. So it can be used to sign things that Alice did not agree to sign. So public key cryptography in general is quite slow, computationally slow. Things like AES, they work extremely, extremely fast. And so public key crypto is typically only used to exchange things like encryption keys that are then used for block ciphers, like AES, or to sh sign short digests of messages. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture on hash functions, so I'll just leave that there for now. But the point is that it's when we do a public key cryptographical... Uh, when we implement public key cryptography for doing message signatures, we don't actually sign the message in its entirety, but rather a short hash of the message instead. And similarly, we don't use public key cryptography to encrypt every single message back and forth. We use it once to exchange a key or to facilitate a key exchange, and then we simply use that key from that point using something fast like AES. So public key cryptography is this useful first step in order to do facilitate a key exchange, and to provide authenticity. Alice knows that this key came from Bob. It didn't come from Eve because Alice can verify Bob's signature. But once that's happened, then simply standard symmetric crypto, things like AES, are just used to, for the actual bulk uh, exchange of data. So let's talk now about key exchange. Alice wants to talk to Bob. So she picks a random key K, encrypts it with Bob's public key, the encryption of, with PK of K, and gives that to Bob. What can go wrong with this approach? What can go wrong with this? Alice picks a random key K, encrypts it with Bob's public key, and gives it to Bob. And with the assumption being, okay, now Bob and Alice should talk to each other using this key to secure all their communications. Well, one issue with this is this notion of perfect forward secrecy, which states that the compromise of a long-term secret should not impact the secrecy of previous, that is to say finished, communication sessions. What does that mean in this context? Well, in this case, we're assuming that Bob can, is the only entity on the planet that can decrypt this message, that can decrypt K. 
If you know K, you can then decrypt everything Alice and Bob then say to each other afterwards. But if it happens that, say, 10 years later, Bob accidentally throws out his computer and the key is on it, and Eve is able to then read the corresponding private key, and Eve happened to have been recording all of the communications between Alice and Bob over the years, Eve can then decrypt what Bob could decrypt. Eve can decrypt the encryption of K, now has the key that was used to secure the actual communication, the AES key that was used for Alice and Bob's communication, and can thereby decrypt everything, right? And this means everything that was ever sent, even though the communication finished long, long time ago. Right, and another way to think of it is if Google had a public key pair, like a public key and a private key, and everyone just did this approach, picked a random session key, encrypted it with Google's public key, and sent it to Google, and ever once in the future this corresponding private key was revealed, all communication between people and Google would then be revealed to an adversary who had gained access to this piece of information and had logged all this information. Clearly this is undesirable. We want to have some confidence that Alice and Bob are communicating and they stop, and unless that was compromised then, it's done. It can't be compromised after the fact. And this is what this notion of perfect forward secrecy is. Going forwards, previous communication sessions are no longer at risk to be exposed. So, to do this, we need to have a system where we don't simply send the key over and then the other person decrypts it and, and uses that key. And to do that, we use a notion of key negotiation, which is done using discrete logarithms. So, discrete logarithms are these interesting things where when you compute the a, a, log uh, a modular multiplication, like say I have this example, 2 to the 1, the power 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4, 2 to the 3 is 8, 2 to the 4 is 16, so far very familiar, 2 to the 5 is 15, because we're doing this modulo 17. So we're not actually computing exponents to an, uh, over the integers, but rather over the integers modulo 17. So 2 to the 5 is actually 32. When we reduce 32 by 17, we end up with 15. 2 to the 6 is 64. When we reduce 64 by 17, we get 13. 2 to the 7 is 128. When we reduce that, we get 9. So we can, all of the standard mathematics works when we're still working inside these uh, rings of mo uh, integers modulo sum prime. We can have this idea that we can compute 2 to the 7 mod 17 and get the number 9. The interesting thing about this, though, is that the reverse operation is believed to be computationally infeasible in the sense that as long as your, your modulo class is big enough, as long as you're working over a sufficiently large number, range of numbers, the idea of getting the number 9 and being asked, how many times did I raise 2 to the something to get 9 mod some other number? That is, given 9, com determining 7 was the 2 to the 7 to create that 9, or given 13, computing it's 2 to the 6. That's believed to be hard, making this a one-way function. One way in the sense that I can compute 2 to the 5 easily. I just compute 2 to the 5. And then I reduce it modulo. Now, in practice, it's done a little bit differently, but we don't need to worry about the details there. The point is that we can compute in the forward direction in a straightforward way. Whereas, just given 9 or 2 or, or 8 or 6 or 4, figuring out what position it was in on this table what you have to raise 2 to the power of to get that number, your, your best approach is more or less trial and error, just trying them all until you get them. Now, again, there's more technical ways of, of doing this quickly or faster, and the course on public key cryptography and the mathematics behind it should surely cover that in more detail. But the main premise here is that we have a function, this discrete logarithm, where in one direction... Computing 2 to the i mod n is easy. In the reverse direction, determining i such that 2 to the i is equal to some particular number k when reduced modulo n is hard. We can't do that. So, 
Given 2 and 7, computing 2 to the 7 mod 17 is easy. Given 9, working out that it is, in fact, 2 to the 7 mod 17 that creates that is not easy. And this asymmetry between the forward direction of this function, exponentiation, and the reverse direction of this function, that is logarithms, discrete logarithms, because we're working over a discrete group, this difference in that one is easy and one is hard allows us to have some very interesting cryptographic primitives. The idea is that given y, g, and n such that y is equal to g to the x mod n, determining x is believed to be computationally infeasible, so again, an adversary who has a computational bound, as long as the n is large enough and some other properties about this that we don't need to get into. The key point is that these discrete logarithms allow for key negotiation. And this is known as Diffie-Hellman key negotiation. The idea here is that first there's some public agreement on what g and n should be. So it's like 2 and 17 except instead it's going to be thousands of bits long instead so that it actually is secure. But these can be standardized. This is the, the, an al this is part of the algorithm. Just the g and n are in a sense like the standard the standard values that everyone uses. And when I compute some secret, when I want to uh, pr produce a, a secret key, I do a key negotiation in the following way. I choose a random number x, some random x, and I compute g to the x mod n. And then I publish that information. I send it over the network. Recall, it is believed that given g to the x, mod n, and knowing g and n, you cannot determine x. Similarly, you can choose y, compute g to the y of mod n, and send it back. Again, someone who's just looking at the network traffic sees g to the x but can't figure out x, sees g to the y but can't figure out y. But both parties, the one and the other, are one knows x and one knows y. If Alice chose x and Bob chose y, then Alice receives g to the y and knows x. So Alice can take g to the y and further exponentiate it by x. Similarly, Bob can take g to the x, which he receives of the network, and exponentiate it with this private value y, which he thought of but never told anyone. And it turns out that these two numbers are the same, that g to the y to the x is the same as g to the x to the y. Therefore, the key becomes g to the x, y. Note that no message was ever sent containing g to the x, y. There was never a message that, even encrypted, stored this value, g to the x, y. And this is how we achieve perfect forward secrecy. Even if later someone is able to decrypt, break public key cryptography, that is, break our public key, for example, there's going to be no message that actually contained the key that would reveal it. So as long as this discrete logarithm problem stays hard forever, then we have an assurance on our communication. So what can go wrong here? Well, one, of course, discrete logarithms might not end up being a hard problem after all. Maybe some innovation or a development of quantum computer will reveal this information. But another problem is a man-in-the-middle attack, a minimum, also known as a minimum attack. And the idea here is that Eve, as an active attacker, not a passive attacker who's just monitoring the network traffic, a passive attacker wouldn't be able to determine the key that Alice and Bob are using. But an active attacker could interfere with their communication. And effectively, Alice negotiates a Diffie-Hellman key with who she thinks is Bob, but it's actually Eve. And Eve negotiates with Bob, who thinks it's actually Alice. Eve then decrypts all traffic from Alice and can read, does what she wants with it, modify it, um, delete it, or uh, just simply read it, and then continues to relay it to Bob. And there's even tools that will do this for you automatically. So this is not a challenging thing to do, it's just some computer program that just runs, basically sits between you and who you're talking to and decrypts all the traffic. 
And there could be reasons for that. For instance, maybe you want to monitor the actual traffic that's happening. You have your web browser, you want to, you know, it's making some connections out onto the internet. And so you have a midim proxy set up. So everything goes through midim proxy. And then you can look at the actual traffic and see what's being said. Or same with mobile phones. If you want to know what information is being sent to various places on the internet by some apps, you can use midim proxy to look at all the traffic that's going between the two endpoints. So let's look at this attack in practice. We have here, Alice and Bob, Alice and Bob choose X and choose Y independently, never sharing that information. Alice then sends G to the X to Bob. Eve can see this, but can't determine X from this. Bob sends G to the Y back to Alice. They both compute G to the Y to the X and G to the X to the Y, which is the same key. So this is Diffie-Hellman working as intended, without the presence of an active attacker, Eve. A passive attacker, Eve, who's looking at this, won't learn the key and can't do anything. There's there, there's no attack against the passive attacker, so this system will work against a passive attacker. But an active attacker, Eve, could intercept the message g to the x and instead pick some other value, g to the a, send that to Bob. Bob with replies with g to the y, unchanged, so Bob's behavior is the same except it observes a instead or g to the a instead of g to the x, and Eve ignores g to the y, but sends g to the b back to Alice. The result is that Alice thinks the key is g to the x b, Bob thinks it's g to the y a, and importantly, Eve is able to compute both these keys. Because Eve chose a and b, and thus knows the values, and Eve receives g to the x and g to the y, and thus can compute g to the x b and g to the y a. So if Alice and Bob are trying to communicate to each other, Alice will encrypt everything with a key known to Eve. Eve will then decrypt that, re-encrypt it with a key known to Bob, and forward it to Bob. And Alice and Bob won't ever even know that this is happening. It's happening transparently. All of the messages are being decrypted and re-encrypted transparently as they're going through the network. So the main problem is that Alice has never seen any evidence that she was actually talking to Bob. Alice did a key negotiation protocol, but Alice did it over an insecure channel to an unknown entity, hoping, intending perhaps, that it was Bob. But there was never any evidence that it actually was Bob, and thus this attack can occur. So another proposal. Here we have Alice sending to Bob G to the X, and a signature of g to the x. You see that this would break this step because Eve cannot compute a signature for g to the a for the particular g to the a that Eve wants to use. So Alice chooses g to the x and provides a signature that shows that it's from Alice, a signature, Alice's signature on g to the x, and gives it to Bob. Bob can do the same thing, compute g to the y, and send a signature of g to the y alongside. Now, Alice knows that she received the key negotiation parameter, as it's called, the g to the y from Bob. This key negotiation parameter was from Bob because it's signed by Bob. And Bob has similar confidence in the g to the x that he received from Alice, as it is also signed by Alice. They can both check, validate the signatures, assuming they each have each other's public key, the public key required to verify these signatures, and then be confident that they can communicate securely. Now, this step where they actually have the authentic public key for each other, that's non-trivial, and there's an enormous amount of work there, and we're going to devote an entire lecture to this. It's uh, at, at least how it's implemented on the internet, which is through certificates and the certificate authorities. But if we imagine that Alice and Bob somehow, maybe they met once in person, exchanged business cards that had their public key on it, they could then validate that this was the that the signature is correct. So from this, we can take an authentic channel meaning Alice and Bob could authentically exchange their public key information and turn it into an authentic secure channel by signing their key negotiation parameters. But nevertheless, there is still an attack on this, proposed, on this system as we proposed it, and this is known as a replay attack. So the attack works like this. Suppose that Eve somehow knows some A 
and a signature from Alice of G to the A. Now, how Eve obtains this, it's unclear, but it doesn't seem impossible that this could ever happen at any point in history. All Eve needs is one single A and a signature from Alice for the corresponding G to the A. Maybe Eve breaks into Alice's computer and is able to get that. Maybe Eve somehow convinces Alice to sign G to the A for some other reason. Regardless, we assume that Eve has access to this one single pair. This allows Eve to impersonate Alice forever afterwards, which is a devastating consequence of a small amount of, comp uh, of, of information that's been made available to Eve. How does this work? Well, suppose that Alice intends to begin communication with Bob through a channel controlled by Eve. So Alice first sends to Eve G to the X and a signature of G to the X. Eve is free to disregard that and instead send G to the A and a signature of G to the A. Bob will look at this signature and from Bob's perspective, this looks like Alice just sent to Bob G to the A and a signature of G to the A. Bob doesn't realize that Eve is simply replaying some old stale value of G to the A. So Bob would reply with G to the Y and a signature from Bob of G to the Y. And at this point, Eve could pass that on backwards to Alice. And Alice would be unaware that Eve has done this interference. And note that Bob will think that the key is G to the Y A. And both Eve and Bob could have computed this value, G to the Y A. And in fact, this attack does not even need to be instigated by Alice. Eve could simply reach out to Bob with G to the A signature of G to the A. Bob would complete authentication by providing G to the Y. Both Eve and Bob compute G to the Y A. Bob thinks he's talking to Alice. Eve knows that he's talking to Eve. And all that this attack requires is that one single time such a key has been made available. Such a, such a key negotiation parameter along with its signature was made available to Eve. So we're going to talk more about key negotiation protocols in subsequent lectures. But the idea here is that these protocols are not just straightforward, even if we are using excellent cryptography that we can base the security on. We still need to make this use of the cryptography avoid all these kinds of attacks, man-in-the-middle attacks, replay attacks, and so forth like that.